The morning began like any other, quiet, ordinary, and painfully lonely. The sunlight spilled through the lace curtains, casting delicate patterns on the kitchen floor. I was humming an old song my late husband loved while stirring a pot of soup, trying to ignore the heaviness pressing against my chest. Lately, even small tasks left me exhausted, but I told myself it was just age catching up. My son, Daniel, used to call every Sunday, asking about my day, teasing me about my soap operas, or reminding me to eat well. But after he married Sophie, those calls became infrequent and rushed. Sophie was graceful and poised, but there was something cold behind her smile, a calculating precision in her words and gestures that always made me feel like I was intruding. Still, I tried to be kind, telling myself that she made Daniel happy and that should be enough. That evening, as I reached for the spice rack, a sudden wave of dizziness swept over me. My hands trembled, the spoon slipped from my fingers, and the room tilted alarmingly. I grasped for the counter to steady myself, but the world faded to black before I could find my balance. When I awoke, I was in a hospital bed, surrounded by sterile white walls and the soft beeping of machines. A nurse leaned over me, her expression gentle. Mrs. Hale, you fainted from exhaustion and low blood pressure. You're going to be okay. We contacted your son, but... She paused, her voice softening. He didn't answer. His wife said she'd let him know. My heart sank. Daniel always came when I needed him, always. Surely there must be a mistake. I waited, holding on to hope, but hours passed with no familiar footsteps, no worried voice calling my name. Only the hum of the hospital and the rhythmic beep of the monitor kept me company. Later, the nurse returned my phone. I checked it automatically, but there were no messages. Then a notification blinked at me, a new social media post. With a trembling hand, I opened it and froze. There they were, Daniel and Sophie, elegantly dressed, smiling at a fancy restaurant. Sophie's caption read, Family first read, Dinner with my man. The words stabbed through me, while I lay in a hospital bed, tubes in my arms, they were out celebrating, showing the world their happiness while forgetting I even existed, when I was discharged. The next morning, no one came to pick me up. I took a taxi home, each street passing by like a reminder of how alone I had become. My house welcomed me with silence, every corner echoing memories of better days. I sat in my old chair, staring at Daniel's childhood photos, and whispered, Where did my boy go? No answer came, only the quiet, heavy, suffocating, and full of truth. Something inside me shifted that day. The woman who collapsed in her kitchen was weak. The one who stood back up would never be again. The days after my hospital stay felt heavier than the illness itself. Daniel still hadn't called, and every unanswered text and missed call gnawed at me. I tried to convince myself he was busy or perhaps Sophie had forgotten to tell him. But deep down, I knew it wasn't forgetfulness. Sophie never forgot anything. She was always careful, precise, controlling. And I had just become another obstacle in her path. It was a chilly morning when I found a thick envelope from the bank lying on my doorstep. At first, I thought it might be a statement or an old notice, but when I opened it, my hands began to shake. Inside were mortgage documents, papers signed under my name. My house, the home my late husband and I had built brick by brick, was now listed as collateral for a loan I never agreed to. I sank into my chair, staring at the neat, precise handwriting. The borrower's names were printed clearly, Daniel Hale and Sophie Hale, my heart clenched, how could my own son, boy who once held my hand and promised to protect me, betray me so completely. The documents felt like a knife pressing into my chest. I tried to steady my breathing, but the betrayal cut deeper than any physical pain I had ever known. My thoughts went back to Daniel's childhood, the way he used to run to me when he was scared, the way he laughed and held my hand in the garden. I pressed my hand to my chest, whispering to the empty kitchen. You already had everything I could give you, why this? Later, I called the bank, pretending to be confused and frail. Hello, I said softly, I believe there's a mistake regarding a loan in my name. 
The representative hesitated, then replied, Mrs. Hale, your daughter. In law handled most of the paperwork. Everything appears to be in order. I nodded silently, my throat tight. Of course it was Sophie. I hung up without another word, a cold resolve settling in my chest. That night, I sat alone in dim light of my kitchen, staring at the documents. Betrayal by those you love doesn't wound the same way as pain from the world. It seeps slowly, eroding trust, leaving emptiness in its place. I wanted to confront them to demand answers to scream. But I knew Sophie well enough to know that confrontation would only fuel her arrogance. She would twist the story, make Daniel believe I was confused, senile, or ungrateful. No, I needed patience. I folded the papers carefully and placed them in a drawer. The hurt remained sharp and bitter, but beneath it, a quiet strength began to grow. Not yet vengeance, but the seed of one. You've taken what's mine. I whispered into the silence, but you've forgotten who I am. And for the first time since the collapse, I felt a flicker of hope. Not hope for their love, but hope for justice. After discovering the forged mortgage, I stopped waiting for calls that would never come. The pain had hardened into something sharper, a quiet, simmering determination. I moved through my days deliberately, pretending to be frail and forgetful, the weak woman Sophie thought I was, but inside, my mind worked like a finely tuned machine. Planning every step carefully, the first thing I did was visit the bank in person. I wore the coat Daniel had bought me years ago, the one Sophie always said made me look old-fashioned, and walked in slowly, leaning on my cane. I'd like copies of my loan documents. I said softly, with a polite smile, just for my records. The clerk handed them over without hesitation. I thanked her, hiding the thrill of victory and went home. There I meticulously photographed every page, the forged signatures, the dates, the account numbers. Evidence cold, precise, and irrefutable. The next day I visited my late husband's lawyer, Mr. Reed. He had been our family's trusted advisor for decades and had known my husband well. When I explained the situation, his eyes darkened with concern. Martha, he said gently, this is serious fraud, forgery. You could take immediate legal action. I shook my head slowly, not yet. Sophie is clever. If I move too quickly, she will manipulate Daniel into thinking I'm confused, old, perhaps even imagining things. I need patience. I need control. He studied me quietly, sensing the strength beneath my calm voice. Then we prepare carefully, he said. For the next few weeks, I played my part perfectly. I called Daniel occasionally, speaking softly, pretending to be vulnerable and forgetful. I feel much better now, I'd say. Maybe you and Sophie could come for dinner soon. Finally, Sophie agreed. Her tone was cautious, but curiosity flickered in her voice. Dinner? That's nice. The trap was set. In the days leading up to the dinner, I prepared meticulously. I polished the silverware, baked Daniel's favorite pie, and set the table with care. I placed my late husband's photograph on the mantel, his calm, proud eyes seeming to watch over me, reminding me of my own strength. The night they arrived, Sophie's perfume filled the room before she spoke. Martha, everything looks quaint, she said, her usual condescending tone evident. I smiled politely. Thank you, dear. I wanted tonight to be special. Inside, I was calm, steady, and patient. The woman they had underestimated for so long was no longer weak. The storm was ready, and they were walking right into it. I poured the wine, offered the first course, and waited. They had come for dinner, but they would leave with far more than they expected. The night of the dinner arrived, calm and quiet, yet heavy <coughs> with anticipation. Candles flickered softly on the table, casting warm light across the room. I had spent the entire day preparing roasting chicken with lemon butter, arranging the table with my finest china and baking Daniel's favorite pie. Every detail was deliberate. This night would be perfect for them, it seemed, but more importantly for me. When Daniel and Sophie arrived, they looked picture perfect as always. Sophie's diamond earrings caught the candlelight, and Daniel's expensive watch gleamed on his wrist. 
He greeted me with a stiff hug. Sophie's smile was wide and polished, but it didn't reach her eyes. Everything smells wonderful, Sophie said, her voice sweet but edged with condescension as she inspected the room. Thank you. I replied softly. I want it tonight to be special. For a few moments, we ate in polite silence, the clinking of silver where the only sound. Then Sophie broke it. So, Martha, are you feeling better after your little incident? We were so worried. I smiled faintly, letting the words sting. Yes, I could tell. You both looked very happy that night. Your post said family first, didn't it? Sophie froze, then forced a laugh. Oh, that. Just a harmless caption, of course. I said lightly, folding my napkin. Speaking of family, I had a meeting with the bank recently. Daniel's fork paused midair. Sophie's eyes flicked to him. Nervously, the bank. She asked, her voice slightly tight. Yes, I said, reaching into my handbag and placing a folder on the table. It seems my signature has been very busy lately, signing papers I never saw. Sophie's composure faltered. Daniel's face turned pale. I know about the forged mortgage. I continued calmly. I know you used my house to secure a loan. And I know the law doesn't look kindly on that sort of thing. Daniel stammered, Mom, I, I didn't know. I raised my hand gently. Don't. You may not have written the lies, but you allowed them to happen. Sophie stood abruptly, fear flashing in her eyes. You wouldn't dare report us. I already have, I said softly. The authorities will be in touch soon. I've ensured Daniel's name is protected, but yours, Sophie, will not be. Her mouth opened, then closed. No words came. She had no defense, no power, no control. Weeks later, her social media vanished, her reputation shattered, and her influence over Daniel crumbled. Daniel returned to me, humbled, finally seeing the truth and the woman he had once loved and respected. I sold the house, cleared the debts, and moved to a small cottage by the sea. Every morning, I watched the sunrise, feeling a peace I hadn't known in years. Revenge, I realized, does not always roar. Sometimes it whispers quiet, deliberate, and inevitable. And when it arrives, those who thought themselves untouchable fall beautifully, perfectly, and utterly.